Revolver Underground. What's going on, guys? It's Rock Revolver Underground, another Skype interview, and I am here with David Martinez. What's going on, man? Nothing much. How are you doing? You know, I'm doing well. Uh, we're out here in L.A., just moved from Nashville, Tennessee, and enjoying being this close to the freaking beach. Love it. Love it. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's, let's find out what's going on with you, man. You are, you're from Texas, correct? Correct. Now, the, the biggest thing I know about Texas as far as the music scene goes is Austin. Yeah, that's, that's the uh, self-proclaimed music capital of the world. There's, would, um, would you go as far as to say the Mecca? It's the Mecca in Texas, definitely. It's, it's the Mecca around this region especially. You know, so. Right, very nice. Now, you've spent some time at South by Southwest. Yeah, the last I've been there the last four years. Played the last three, so wow. And I plan on going there again. So I have yet to be there, and I I want to so bad. Um, is how, how does that how does it uh, uh, work? Have you been to other festivals and and you know played other festivals and all that kind of stuff, or is this kind of where you like? This to is kind of this is kind of where I go right now. I would like to get to more stuff. I know I know Portland, Oregon has some cool stuff, and uh, even L A. The with the um, I forgot what L A. has. They have the uh, uh um. It's usually at the beginning of the year. Yes. Um, I live here, and I should know this, but I don't. <laughs> uh, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I get it. Um, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, it stumped me. Uh, anyway, um, so what, South by Southwest. Now, this is uh, – what, what was that kind of – what was that like for you to be to play there? Oh, it was. It, it's a great experience because, I mean, there's just music lovers everywhere, people to network it with uh, – people in the industry such as print media film you know all that it's it's a networking gold mine if, if, if you're if you're an independent artist uh, this would be a place to go to even if even if you're not playing it I mean the first year I went I I couldn't even believe I never went because it was just <laughs> I was just like what the hell have I been doing this whole time and uh, but you know I made so many contacts um, got to see some great artists like Ben Harper you know play and yeah. so I was actually on TV for that one, but I was I was like nice. front row or something. Nice, Rock but it, it it was a uh, it was a great it was it was a great experience. And the next year, I just made it a goal to play every year. And um, since I got since I got in con since I've been uh, associated with Lady Lake Music, uh, last year was um, the first time they promoted promoted. And I I definitely love the work that they do. They're very hardworking ladies, and and they're 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 about independent music, and it's it's just a uh, South by Southwest is like it's a huge party for one thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now how many this is this is a few days or is it just like a weekend? I can't remember. Well, you know, it just used to be music, but now it starts I think it's like eleven days or twelve days. It starts oh, with wow. it starts with a film, the interactive and then the film, and then they do the music for like about four or five days. So it's it's a <laughs> uh, it's a pretty big event. I mean, it's it's turned into it's turned into a huge, huge event, especially for the, I mean, it's a cool thing because it's it's about the arts too. So you know, right? And this is it, it kind of takes over the city really because it's like a, almost uh, as far as the music goes, it's like a bar hop type thing, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's kind of cool because then you get to see different venues, and it's not just one area as like most festivals do. They have that main stage, but you get to see a whole bunch of different uh, venues and listen to it, a whole bunch of different different genres of music. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, you know, when you live in California, I mean, I, I recorded my record there. I, I'll tell you one thing about Texas, uh, especially during South by Southwest, they have cheap beer. So <laughs> <laughs> that's always a plus. Always. Uh, I think I went out the other night and I spent twenty bucks on uh, on two drinks, which you know that's 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 normal. But the the two weekends before, I believe, yeah, the two weekends before, I think it was like thirty five for two mixed drinks, and I'm yeah. I'm like, are you, uh, what? And it was half ice. Are you kidding me? So now I take a flask. How yeah, it yeah. It sounds it sounds like Malibu. Yeah, Malibu. yeah. That's it's. I think it's bleeding over into the entire state of well, the bankrupt. So they're charging you know eighty five dollars a drink now for everything, and it's yeah. it's dumb. Anyway, yeah, it's annoying. <laughs> yeah. It's annoying. Uh, so you uh, you said this is your your third year of playing South by Southwest. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. uh, yeah, it was. I did. I've done it the last three years. I've, okay. I've Very played nice. a couple of shows here and there. So. So this is something that you would suggest uh, to to other artists to to do. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, uh, one thing I find in a lot of artists is fear. Yeah. And, and you know, if you if you if you're going to try to get your music out there, you got to. We we live in an age now, especially with independent music, the indies. I mean, I hear the indies; they sound so much better than what's on the radio now, and and it's it's insane because 
you know, a lot of indies are starting to get signed, you know, and but they're doing the thing is they're doing it their way. But it's also funny because it's funny because a lot of artists have that mentality where they wait they're waiting for to be discovered. And I read an article on that and I mean if I always live by the philosophy if you're gonna if you want something you gotta go get it. Yep. And I, I tell I tell my my mom actually called me one day and she said, I was watching this. I, I don't know what TV show she was watching. I saw a record producer on there and he said the biggest thing to do in the business is to network. Do you do that? I said, <laughs> what the hell do you think I've been doing all these years? And she goes, yes. okay, I'm, just make, I'm just making sure. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> Yes, and that's the thing. If you want to get anywhere, you have to network. I mean, that's you know, that's uh, you know, being an independent artist myself. That's the only yeah. way that I've gotten any type of shows, any type of uh, you know, fan base at all is just networking through whether it be you know other industry people or other bands, other fans. Uh, obviously, the social networking sites. I, I agree. That's that's the case. You got You got to network. It's it's the only way to do it. Yeah. Simple and, as that. Well, there was one guy who told me I, this kind of freaked me out. He was asking me about this and that, and he was. I said, well, you got to network, and you got That's the number one thing you got to do in order to get your music out. And he's all, what does that mean? I said, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I said, oh. I said get a dictionary. Yeah, or learn, learn that word. Google I go, it. I said, I can't. I can't help you. I can't help you unless, you know. And oh. it, it kind of, it kind of frustrates me because I want to help a lot of artists because I, I, I feel that I've had pretty unique experience over the last six years. You know, I, I could have worked on a PhD, but I decided. I, I told the lady, I said, you know what, I'm gonna learn how to play rock and roll. You know, so I figure I have some, some, some talent. You know, yeah, <laughs> somewhere, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm kind of glad I did because you know the experiences with music have just gone beyond. But one of the things is I've had some pretty neat experiences. I've had some pretty rough ones too. But you know, we all have them as artists. And one thing I tell, I try to tell other artists, especially some of the local artists around here, is that you know you can get it, but you gotta, you gotta work for it, and you gotta, you gotta hustle and. And the number one thing is to make a record. Make records. Yeah. So you're saying that overnight success is not something that happens? <laughs> that's, that's so weird. You know, you know, Zach Brown, they they they're an overnight success, but I guess they've been playing together for twelve years. And right, yeah. Yes, yeah. That, that's so that's overnight, overnight <laughs> over twelve years. Yeah, right. Yeah. Interesting yeah. how that works. Uh so you now you how long have you been playing? Playing music over twenty years. I mean, I've been writing for over twenty years. But I mean, I, like I, I had an interview this morning. I said when I was younger, I was, I uh, a lot of the stuff I wrote was there, were, there was a couple of cool songs, but all of them weren't really good. But <laughs> but I think the the cool thing is like uh, I had always written some songs, and you know I had never sang. That wasn't my thing. I I just wanted to play guitar. I mean, I wanted to be like Ace Frehley and Slash, and you know, and Jimmy Page, and right, and uh, I. I that's all I wanted, and you know, I had written some songs, and a couple of my buddies were like, you know, you got to, about a little over 10 years ago, they go, you got to go out and sing these songs to people, Let's go to an open mic, and I'm like, I was like, no, I said, I, I, you know, I said, okay, I'll do it, you know, and I remember the biggest thing, there's this guy named Ray Summy, he runs an open mic here, he's been doing it for years, and I'm sitting there, and it's my turn, he says, so, he goes, so what are you going to do, you ready, you ready to go, and I said, uh, well, uh, he goes, are you going to watch, or are you going to play? Oh, and I was like, <laughs> and that was the biggest thing that helped me. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, I went up there and it was kind of shaky, but, yeah. you know, doing it on a regular basis, met some cool guys. And this guy named Jimmy Wilden, I'm doing a show with him Saturday. We we just said, screw it. And we put together a tour in 2006 and we we went around the country, like to the to the West Coast. That's where I met Leroy Miller, uh, you know, when, yeah. when I was in L.A. And uh, we went we went all over the place and... I, I think the thing is, we did some Texas dates, and then we went to New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Tucson, Arizona, San Diego, L.A., San Francisco, Seattle, and St. Paul, Minnesota, and Janesville, Wisconsin. We wow. came back. Yeah, we just, I mean, we put, we raised some money. We just, we just uh, lived on the budget, and we um, we had a good time playing music. Man. And it, to me, that opened up my eyes. It it showed me on one end. Um, one thing is, you know, what I notice with a lot of artists is they think they're better than they are. Mm. You ever notice that? Yep. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, yeah. I think the thing, thing about that, it really opened my eyes to to know that, you know, that there's so much talent out there. There's yeah. so much talent. And it's just like my goal was just to get better. And, you know, working with Leroy Miller, he he's not a yes man. So I, I can 
that's what I like about working with him because he'll tell me if it's not good or he'll tell me, you know. And of course, it's just his opinion, but I mean, with a lot of the work I put out, you know, I, I, get, I get good responses. And, yeah. And it's also helped my live performance over the years. So, so yeah, that's, that, that's the one thing. Learning is, to me, is one of the biggest. Uh, and I think, I think once you've stopped learning, learning, then yes. you need to just get out um, because you're, you're not absorbing anymore. Oh yeah, my friend, my friend, uh, my friend. He's a drummer, Eddie Mendoza. He lives in Seattle and uh, plays an R.A. Moore band. His girlfriend. And one of the things he told me, told me back in two thousand four, two thousand five. He said, "You know, there was a couple artists. You know, they were bigger than the music," as he said. And he says, "Once you're bigger than the music, he said it's time to quit because there's there's nothing else you can do." Yep. When you he goes and he goes, "You can never be bigger than the music because the, the music will crush you alive." Yep. Even bigger artists, you know, because so I was like, wow, that, that was pretty deep. And it was, <laughs> <laughs> it made no sense. You know, it's like, and I, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to play showcases around the country with other talented artists and it, it keeps you grounded. And I, I mean, I try to tell a lot of cats that, you know, get out there and I, I need to take advice from you. I go, go get it. And I said, I'll give you advice, but the thing is doing it. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with, with artists that, uh, you know, especially indie artists don't, you you can't be passive you have to be aggressive you have to go get it you have to actively pursue what you're doing and in doing that i think you know if if you want a label or if you want uh fans even they're going to see this they're going to see that you're actively pursuing them they're they're, they're pursuing your career and they're going to see that they're going to respect that and they're going to like you for it. they're going to love you for it um you know don't sit back and and just be a spectator as as your friend said you know are you going to sit back or are you going to play what are you going to do Yes. Um, if you want to take it, go, go get it, go, go do it. Uh, here, here's a question for you. You, what do you, uh, what's your take on, on, on record labels? Are they a necessity today or are they kind of, uh, I mean, obviously you're seeing them fall to the wayside left and right, but uh, yeah, what, what does that mean? I mean, is it something that is necessary? Well, you know, honest, I, you know, honestly, I hate to say this too, but I think the record, industry is putting out crap this day, these days agreed and it's just like one thing my brother said you know and i don't want to mention the artist's names but he goes some of the stuff you hear it was just like they shove it down your throat and it's like it's like when you have somebody else you know like you know like a ben harper or you know or you know you know some other artist you, know, you listen to that because you want to listen to it and it's good you know and it's it's not shoved down your throat and he goes I mean, there's countless songs that you hear on the radio, and you're just like, "Oh my god!" And it's 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 pretty crazy. I just I I think one thing I read an article. I, I like I like this music cloud, and there was one thing is that um, one of the questions was, "Is there any is there any band that's inspiring anymore? Like inspiring anymore? Like Led Zeppelin? Because back then the bands they they signed the bands and they would grow. Yeah. They would let the bands grow, and and unless you're an overnight success now apparently you know that oh yeah <laughs> then they're gonna drop you yeah and and you know what and uh so the biggest thing is i mean i grew up you know listening to bands like led zeppelin grand funk railroad because of my dad and i i i, I research a lot of that history you know and I'm, I'm like those bands grew you know some of them faltered you know at the at the end of the but they they their music was always timeless and i i, I don't hear that anymore and i think if I think it's more the indie record labels that are putting out the good music, you know. I and, agree. I agree. Do you think that we're going to get back to that type of music, as far as the the you know the organic type of music? I hope so. I really do. I mean, I would. I I I, I would like. I mean, we live in we live in such an instant access age now, where everybody wants. You know, it's like. But the thing is, you got to let the music breathe. You got to let the music grow. I mean, I think if I was signed to a label. The two these records, I don't think they would have let me release them, because right. you know, it doesn't sound like you know. But I always wanted my own sound, and I wanted I wanted to do things my way. And and I mean, I know there's always some compromise, but I, I just don't think the I think with a I've heard a lot of indie music out there, and, I, and it's just like people say, well, why aren't these people signed? I go because well, the record industry is they're a bunch of idiots these days. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. I hate to say that, but I mean, well, I mean, it, it's it's to me, it's common knowledge because I'm I'm in the industry. But yeah. you know, I just for me being an indie artist and and being being uh, you know go, going through the stuff that I've gone through, 
I don't I don't like labels uh, uh, as far as as far as the the mainstream labels go. You know, I deal with a lot of indie labels that are for the artists. They they push stuff for the artists. They do as much as they can with the, with a little budget that they have or no budget that they have. But the labels that that we are used to hearing about, used to that we know about today, I'm done. I'm sick of it. I just um just just fall off the face of the earth. Let's start over. Let's make something new. Another thing I heard too is they follow the boy band formula, Weird. which. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. It, it's like, like I said, you, you, they don't allow artists to grow anymore. Yep. And there's, there's nobody, there's really, there's hardly anybody these days that's inspiring. You know, I really respect the hell out of Pearl Jam for what they did back in the '90s when they decided, screw this, we're not going to make videos. You know, people might hate us, you know, whatever. But they've come back to be a pretty big legendary band, and a lot of people thought they were broken up. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like, I remember being in, back in Nashville. I was working as a as a DJ on a rock station announcing their new album coming out after like 15 years or something like that. And I was like, "What? I don't remember. I don't understand. What I thought they were, you know, I thought they were gone and and they just came back and I was so excited about having them do their thing and and come back and I just I I was amazed at how well they they come and and done things through the years and they'd been off the game so long and now they're back at it and just it was yeah. amazing to me. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, big time. And it, it's it's pretty crazy like that because, I mean, you don't have artists like that anymore. I, I don't see it. I mean, I I don't. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's just kind of like, I mean, I've gone to see some artists that, you know, are on TV that are the head honchos and pretty overrated. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. I, I You know, I want to get back. Uh, I want artists, uh, and I think we're on the, on the track as far as the indie scene goes, but I want to get back to that. I want to get back to the to the I, I'm coming to see you because you're awesome. I'm coming to see your five minute solo because it's awesome. I, I want you to be organic. I don't want you to be three three minutes and thirty seconds. I want you to, to write a song. If it's a minute, great. If it's if it's five minutes, great. I want you to write a song because it came from your heart, not because it came from some douchebag that's sitting in a corporate office that says this can sell. I don't like that. Yeah. Like it's, you know, it's annoying. Yeah, I know. I, I, I watch these judges on, on these shows. Oh my god. And I'm just like are you serious? <laughs> yeah, you've, written, you've written songs, but what song has been a hit for you? Yeah, you singing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and who writes for themselves anymore? Who does that? Yeah, I hate that too. And you know the thing is, uh, there's there. I've heard of artists, you know, where they go in, you know, where they've been on American Idol, and they go in thinking they're they sign a li- to a label, and they're thinking, all right, I got some songs. No, we're bringing writers in to write for yep. you. Yep. Yep. That's a bunch of. That's a bunch of. BS right there. Yep. Because it, it's turned into entertainment now. It's not. It takes, it takes away your identity. I mean, <sighs> what if somebody came and told Jimmy Page and Robert Plant that? <laughs> I yeah. don't think anybody would have ever t- have said yeah. that. Yeah, what there, if somebody- there would have probably been some words. Yeah. It would not have been a good. That's just writers, you know? Yep. I just, I don't understand that. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, you, you see somebody that you think would be really good on stage, but I, I just don't understand the whole, I'm just going to be an entertainer, not a writer. I don't, I don't know why that's the case anymore. I mean, there's a lot of good artists out there that are doing, you know, doing really well at just simply writing. Maybe they don't look the best or maybe they don't, you know, I mean, Susan Boyle, come on. I mean, she, you know, she didn't look the greatest, but she has an amazing voice. And, uh, you know, I, I'm probably going to get crap for that. Look forward to your emails. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things where I was surprised, actually, that the music industry decided that let's let's take her. Let's do this. And, you know, let's let's move forward with this because she wasn't the package. She wasn't the, you know, the the uh, the template, if you will. And I was actually impressed with that. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, did, did we know how Mountain looked? They weren't. They didn't look the best, <laughs> you know. Bachman Turner Overdrive, uh, yes. Jerry Garcia, but you yes. know what? They made that they, they were great entertainers, and I mean, and not entertainment, as said, but it's it was entertaining because they had good songs. Yeah, they absolutely. Songs. You you were intrigued by what they were doing, yeah. and that that that's the one thing about. I I I think like for me, I think the best records were made in the '60s and the '70s. You know, because because that's that's when the artists actually you know sang, went in, and did their stuff, and and uh. It's just now it's it's so like it, it kind of gets polished a little bit too much and yep. it's just some of some of some of the mainstream songs are really stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lyrically, and that's one of the things I look for in in you know the songs that I put on the show is if you can't capture me lyrically, I don't care how good your song sounds, it just doesn't appeal to me at all. And and you know that's one of the things that uh, I'm I'm a 
a stickler about is great lyrics. I want you to, I don't care what they're about. Uh, I just want them to be good. I want them to be of substance, not just, I want that car. I want, you know, I want the money. I want all this crap. I don't care about that at all. I, I want to be something so bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, give me substance. Give me something to, to chew on here. Yeah. Oh, uh, anyway. Uh, so you, uh, I think it was what back in 2010, you did a, a, a little tour through California, which landed you uh, at a show at the Viper Room. Oh yeah, yeah. It was a little acoustic set out there, and uh, got to do it with three other artists. It was it was a cool event. Um, um, I and it, that would that one just happened by accident. You know, I just kind of like I talked to Leroy, and I said, you know, you, can you get me into the Viper Room? And he's like, yeah, you know, and. You know, it's it's pretty crazy in LA because it's hard to get people to come out. But yeah, I, I had a couple people come out. It was it was it was a cool thing. To think. I I actually played three shows in San Diego before that, and that was really cool. It was set up by a buddy of mine, and um, then went up to Santa Barbara. I know I know a, a cool guy named Dave Cowan up there. He plays for uh, Claude Hopper. And anytime I'm I'm in California, he says, "Let me know," and he goes, "Well, I'll set up a show." He that was just kind of a makeshift show that he put together, and we had a great night. It was singer songwriter night, and we just we just had a blast. And so, yeah, that was that was that was a cool that was a cool time. You know? So when you're setting up for tour, you you know you decide, okay, it's time for me to go back on tour, whether it's a week or two weeks or six months, whatever yeah. it is. You decide this is what I want to do. How do you how do you uh, how do you mentally prepare for that? But also, how do you financially prepare for that tour? Well, well, the thing is, another, another thing that I tell artists too. I say, I say this: when you play live shows, okay, and I know I, I know some of you do it for a living, you know. I said, but take what you and invest it in your career. And you know, and um, another thing is, you know, um, try to decide where your you know where your music is going to fit best. Look, do your research on the internet. So you know, financially. Um, anything I make off of music, I have an, I have a separate account for that. And I just I just use that. Plus, sometimes I'll play I'll play like little fundraisers for myself, like it like a couple of record stores here, and you know people fill up that tip jar, you know, like crazy, and you know just I take it from there, and you know so, and I got a couple of backers too that back me up sometimes for sponsorship if I need a sponsorship. So that's how I financially do that, and you know I invest everything. That I that I make into the, in, into it, you know, and that that's what a lot of people don't do. Yeah, and, and you know, it's like it's about a lot of the times I notice it's about getting drunk. You know, don't get me wrong. You know, you we like we all like to have a good time, but you know, you gotta if you're really serious about your music, you gotta invest in your career and look for places. And the cool thing working with Lady Lake now, they handle a lot of that stuff for me, which I wish I would have known about this a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. They're really enthusiastic, and they they get out there, and you know they they know people, and they're they're working. I mean, before I did it, we did it ourselves, you know, and and I still I still have some places, you know, that I have keep in contact with, and you know I had I have plans of doing, you know, things with. So, yeah, they that's how that's that's how I go about it financially, and you know, is it hard is it hard to to find that balance between. Uh, doing all, all this work on working in the business and working in uh, on the business is that does that make sense? Uh, you know, you're you're doing so much of this back end that sometimes like, do you ever yeah. get sidetracked? And then the songwriting, you're talking yeah. About, yeah, yeah. You got to balance it out. I mean, it's it's it it, it it's tough sometimes because I'm when I'm doing the social media thing, I'm like, dang, I should be writing a song right now. <laughs> I should be working on the song that I got. But like last Friday, I I um. I was up, or I don't know what day it was. I was up till like three or four in the morning working on working on a song and some some other little ideas. And then Saturday night, I was I did kind of did the same thing, and I found some old demos, and I was like, I didn't like the lyrics too much, but I liked the idea of the songs, and I was like, wow, I could work on this, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's one thing Leroy Miller pushed me to do more. He pushed me to be better lyrically a couple of years ago when I recorded a song called "Hey Mary" in Nashville. And we sat there and we worked on it together, and you know he just it was it was kind of cool because you know you could see from my first record, you know a lot of that stuff was written when I was like seventeen, eighteen, and then you know into my twenties, you know. So, but I never really uh, never really pursued it until you know we decided to make a record. So, yeah, it, it, that 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 end, you know, I'll find myself doing that when I I try to balance it out. and I just put all social media away and just 
just would work. Yeah, so there, there, you, you really do need to find that balance. You can't work on. Uh, yeah. I, would you say a schedule is something that you might want to do if you have a problem with that, or just sometimes? I mean, <laughs> I'm the most, what did my mom tell me? I'm the most unorganized person in the world. I mean, oh, I try to be, or, and I yeah, I try to be organized. I was actually working on tour dates today and um, kind of putting some things with a. Uh, on the schedule because I was pretty. I, I got a, an alert at four o'clock in the morning. It was Lady Lake. They go, we got your gig at the House of Blues in Dallas. <laughs> oh, cool. and then Better Than Ezra is playing later. Wow. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So it was it was kind of cool. I said, okay, cool. So I, I said I definitely need to work on this today, and <laughs> I, I was able to. But it's always you know you got to balance it out, and and you know, and then I see you know you know one thing that kind of bums me out. I don't know if I'm getting off the subject on this, but. Uh, one thing that bugs me about out about some artists is how how they go on social media and talk about how badass they are, <sighs> and it's just like I yes. said, you know, honestly, guys, people don't want to hear that. I said, I said, and then the thing is, if you're going to say that, you need to bring it. Yeah, and, yeah, and and it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen it doesn't, more it doesn't, times than not. Yeah, yeah and, you know, I'm so, so humble about it. You know, I, I. I my my dad is still tough on me to this day because he's the one who taught me everything about music and you know, and even he has some critiques to say you know and it kind of kind of bums me out because I want my dad to say you're great, but <laughs> <laughs> he, he actually my mom says he thinks you're great but he always thinks you can get better. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean this is the guy who told me about excuses. He said I don't like excuses. Best bet is not to make them. You know. There you go. And I was there like, well, I, I, I couldn't say anything about it. You know, he, I mean, him and my, my mom divorced when I was young, but, you know, it was it was always kind of cool. And one of the things I remember, one of my memories was my mom was like, you're going to go to college. And my dad was like, he pulls out an album of Ted Nugent. He goes, this is what you're going to do when you grow up. <laughs> <laughs> so I compromised. I, you know, I went to college yeah. Graduated with a master's degree. But my with my dad, I mean, I, I went to make records. I, but I didn't do it because of what they they because my dad made me you know it was it was just it was just something i i wanted to do the funny thing was you know is the music theory you know the music theory yeah, back. yeah and it, a lot of cats don't know that i've with some talented musicians who can't pick it up and these new guys i have in my band you know they're i don't have to i don't have to teach them anything i don't have to like really tell them anything they just we work on little things here and there and, you know it's like they got it and the one thing my dad always told me he said he always said, I'm going to teach you, I need to teach you the chords. Because I, I thought I was the baddest dude in the land. I learned the Sweet Child of Mine riff. I'm like 15 years old. <laughs> Go up, start playing it for him. And he's like, play me the song. Like, do uh... <laughs> Where's well, the chords right here? Look at the chords. He goes, uh... you know your chords, don't you? I said, well, I, I think so. Yeah. I, he said, he gave me a little book of nursery rhymes with chords. And I was, <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is this? And I looked, and I, you know, I went home and I, I worked on it, and, and uh, the funny part was that book actually helped me with transitions and learning the chord progressions and things like that. Then he taught me the, of course, he taught me the pentatonic scale later on. You know, I took some classical lessons, and you know, I never went beyond that, but that taught me some stuff about finger picking and all that. And but all that theory that my dad taught me, even though you know. The songwriting came, came about a couple of years later, and I worked on it generally. Um, the one thing is, it, it just helps so. It's so much easier in the, to go in the studio or work with musicians that know what you're talking about. You know, you know the deal. It's, yeah, it yeah. Makes, it makes so much. It, it saves time and money too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I can, I, I've worked with some musicians where I've spent a couple of days, and I'm like, what the heck am I doing with with these guys? I have, I don't. I mean, we 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 get done. Would would take a couple of days with somebody who doesn't know their theory. We t we get this done in a two hour, three hour rehearsal, you know. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, it's kind of cool. It's kind of it's kind of cool in a sense. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the the launch of your uh, your new EP one more time. Yeah, I think I think. Um, it's going to be coming out. I, I'm tentatively hoping December 11th. I I just I, I'm still going through all the pre-production thing with the artwork and all that, but um, I should be getting that tonight or tomorrow. And um, 
it's gonna be. I'm calling it one more time. I got a song on my album called One More Time. And I was also, you know, we got. I sat down, talked to a couple of people, and they said it's your second album. How about One More Time? I was like, no, oh. never thought of that. I was thinking something else. And then, you know, so yeah, we did seven songs. We did six. We recorded six songs for this record, and then I'm, I'm going to include Hey Mary, the song that I did in Nashville a couple of years ago, with uh, when Leroy was living there, and um, so it should be a pretty solid. Um, solid record. Nice, very cool. And you're you're gonna be doing a little uh, like a little mini tour through uh, through Texas. Is it? Is that through Texas? And uh, we're looking to hit some uh, southeastern, some east coast uh, dates, like especially in Florida, you know, South Carolina, North Carolina, and um, you know, hopefully c- can get up to the upper east coast and fall, um, eventually. But you know, we, the thing with the thing with these ladies is that they they really push this music and they're they're getting it out there and. Um, the, the one thing is I'm really happy with the work is we really sat down, polished it up a little bit, you know, and just, we kept, we kept the, we kept the same, the same, uh, how would you say, we kept, we kept the songs genuine like they originally were, but, you know, we just worked on some little kinks here and there, and sure. I, I was, I was really excited because I, I, I got to play my Les Paul on this album, so, like, <laughs> I, I did something that's a first, you know. I, I I sat there. I was. I remember. I had an interview this morning. I was, said the same thing. I was sitting there with Leroy, and he said we were doing pre-production. And he goes, "Let me ask you a question. What's your goal for this for this uh, for these sessions?" And I like the work we did on my first record, and I think it's. I think it was really a step up for me, you know, from what I've done before. And I said, or never done before. <laughs> and he said, "Well, uh, what, what's your goal?" I said, "I don't want to make the same record." And he said, all right, good. I don't want to pop you over the head and have to tell you that. He said, I don't want you to make the same record either. He says, I still want it to be you. Goes, so you want to use some electric guitars on this. And, you know, we, we went through some of the demos and we picked the best songs. And he was like, all right. So, you know, we did we did things from all electric. Like there's a song called Crazy, right? That's kind of like my rock and roll all night anthem, you know, <laughs> to, to, you know, something like. I covered a song that he wrote called Blue Sky. I always loved it. It kind of had this Almond Brothers feel to it, right? Oh, yeah. He, he told me, he said, you know, he goes, I, he goes, I don't want to do this song the same way. I want you to make it your own. And I was like, I thought about it. I said, what if I do it the same way? Yeah, it's just going to, I said, well, so one night I was just listening to stuff like The Doors and The Beatles and Ben Harper and just, I kind of like, I kind of said, man, I can hear some sitars and <laughs> <laughs> like birds and stuff and he's all like so we listen to some songs and he's all all right well, let's do a demo we did a demo and it was really it was really really um it was neat the way it came out it, it was totally different from the from his song right he's all he goes there you go you made it your own and i i, I was really happy with it so it's like rock on so yeah. he was he was okay with it yeah he was definitely okay oh that's awesome and he, i mean feeling. of course he, of course he helped me with it you know we we really worked hard to get it get it going yeah i i had never the funny thing is you know about singing and phrasing it out i mean i had just learned it right there off the bat so i was having a lot of problems with the phrasing because i was so used to the phrasing phrasing on his original version but right we did the tracks he goes we got it he goes <laughs> so i was like god i go i go because we just we 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 charted it out a little bit and we got it but we and then we did a song, you know, we did, we did, you know, that song one more time. That's kind of like a nice little ballad I wrote. I kind of, what I did on that, I, I, I kind of just like, kind of like took a love letter type, you know, set of lyrics and we just worked on it from there. And at the end of the song, you know, it just has, it's not a traditional first chorus, first chorus. It's kind of had, it's kind of like telling us, uh, um, telling the person you love a story, you know, and it's like about a particular time. And, the cool thing at the end, we uh, kind of did a little Pete Townsend thing, Guns N' Roses, you know, like a patient change. Oh, and uh, nice. As a matter of fact, I will, I will send you an advanced copy digitally if you want to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was a pretty neat experience. And then we got to there's a song called "Coming Home." I wrote that after I did the first record when I was leaving LA, and uh, I was such an idiot. I didn't. I didn't know how hot it was. I mean, I, I didn't even know I was in the desert. But I had this idea, and I stopped. I got my little re- recorder, and I recorded the riff. So I won't forget it. I was like, "Dang, it's hot!" It's on the, the, like 117 degrees, and I was like, "Wow." Yeah. 
but I, I, I ended up finishing writing that song, Coming Home. I, I wrote it in a hotel in Lordsburg, New Mexico. <laughs> wow. I, I think those are the best songs that come out of, you know, just random experiences and hotel rooms and, you know, yeah. long nights. I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. Rock and roll. Yeah. So yeah, the, it, the song, the album has, you know, has, it has some electric guitars in it. I mean, it still do some acoustic on there, but I'm, I'm really happy with the work. It's, it, Leroy told me what he told me, buddy. I, I, after this work, he was like, station from what you've done before and, you know, and coming this to this point, you know, and, he goes, but never be complacent. Like I said, he goes, if you, if you complacency is a killer. And I, was, and I find that a lot with people. The complacency, you know, when you get complacent, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, where can we find your music? Uh, you can find it on iTunes, Amazon, CD Baby. Um, I mean, the, there's some local outlets here in Corpus Christi, like uh, Surf Club Records and Disco Around. Um, I've seen it other places. Like I've seen, I've seen a couple of songs on Rhapsody. Uh, e, uh, is it E Music? I've seen it on E Music. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few outlets that, that carry it. I mean, but the main ones are iTunes, Amazon, and uh, CD Baby. All right. So, and you have a website? Yes, DavidMartinezMusic.com. And I'm I'm current DavidMartinezMusic.com. I'm currently okay. updating that too. So. <laughs> Very yeah. cool. Very cool. David, thanks so much for hanging out, man. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, all the best to, to you and, and what you're doing, man. I'm, I'm excited to, to dig into this and, and see where you're headed and, and see where you're going to go. So rock and roll, man. Absolutely. All right, brother. Well, uh, that's it, man. Go check out the website, guys. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff coming up from this dude right here. You got to go check it out. Go do it right now. Uh, I'm E-Rock. Peace. Revolver Underground.